Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 12, Episode 147. He's Day Brian. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us here on this Tuesday, Steelers Nation. Hopefully everyone had a safe and happy 4th of July. Dave, we've both done some movie watching mm. this weekend, it sounds like. Um, for you, that's probably more common. For me, that's a downright miracle. So you watched Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, and I, yes, I watched a movie. I watched Bull Durham, so... We got to play show and tell here and talk about our movie reviews. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, yeah. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Uh, uh, look, you look at the, uh, the the people in it and you do kind of wonder, man, hey, how how did I miss that one with uh, Alec Baldwin and Al Pacino and what uh, Jack Lemmon and mm-hmm. uh, Ed Harris in that Ed Harris, obviously from uh, what was it? Apollo 13, I think. One of the bigger movies that he's done. He's obviously done uh, uh, other stuff in there. Uh, my main takeaway from it. Well, first, I thought Al Pacino was absolutely great in it. Yeah. Uh, I, I thought he 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 was kind of the runaway uh, kind of the star. I thought his performance was the best in it. I guess my biggest takeaway was just trying to figure out at the end of it, why, you know, what happened, you know, and why, why the abrupt ending of that and what kind of the whole message up message of, of, uh, of the movie was. And, you know, I, I, my, my takeaway is kind of just, you know, always be closing <laughs> you know, <there's> a, <laughs> whatever, whatever's going on in your life, you know, uh, things happen, but, uh, it, you know, the, the, you know, the main the main notion should still be no matter what's going on uh, with your life, always be closing. And that closing could obviously be overcoming an obstacle, you know, uh, uh, you know, not necessarily sales related. And look, I, I related to a lot of that stuff because, you know, I was in, you know, I was I was essentially kind of in the business for 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 you know, several years in the car, in the coffee company. And, uh, look, I mean, they would send us, uh, in groups of like six to, you know, cities that we've never been before and do sales blitzes and living in hotels and, you know, contests and stuff like that. So I, you know, and I've been to some of the sales, you know, uh, seminars and all like that. So, you know, there's a, there, there's part of it that, that, that I definitely get. I, I think I just have had the most trouble with the ending of the movie you know, and, uh, did he really do it? How many people did he have helping him do it? And, and where, where do things go from there? Right. It's been over a year since I've seen it and I've seen it just once, but I mean, I think the guy that is implied to have done it actually did do it. I don't know if there were other people and I don't know if you're hearing that thunder, but there's actually a storm rolling through here today. Uh, how similar was kind of the feel and vibe of that sales feeling compared to what you actually did back back in the day was there kind of a similar was that an accurate depiction of things loosely speaking no i mean uh, to to some degree i mean i understand uh the theory behind it now look we we went out you know basically what what you'd be cold calling you know okay uh go to restaurants and offices and stuff like that you know Uh, it's not like we were going off leads or leads card you know lead cards or anything like that but i understand the premise of that and the time era of it and all like that you know that kind of stuff actually you know, did happen, you know, uh, along those lines where, where, where you, you know, salesmen would get lead cards of people that mail in looking for, you know, that, that kind of thing. So I, I, I think the overall premise of it is, is definitely believable, uh, as is the, you know, living in the bar next door, or, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, kind of aspect of it. And, uh, I mean, there, there's a lot of believable stuff in it. It just, you know, I guess the the question is, 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 was the message at the very beginning where, uh, 
you know, they want you to believe that these are the golden leads. You know, do they pump up the golden leads too much where it becomes a thing where they have to basically break in and steal for them, you know, kind of thing? Or is it something in your head, you know, uh, uh, kind of kind of kind of thing that, look, the, you know, those leads are like every other every other leads. What, you know, lead what what makes those leads so golden and those kind mm-hmm. of things. But uh, uh, look, the psychology of, of, of a salesman doubt doubting himself and the things that, you know, they obviously went through. Uh, it's the leads, you know, you want to blame it on something that you can't close uh, right. th- that kind of thing. So I, I think a, a lot of it, you know, was true, but uh, I, I just stumble with, I, I just I, am troubled with how it ended, you know? Yeah. I would just say overall, again, I'm no movie buff, but I do like a, the financial salesman type of movies. And I like movies that are very dialogue driven where there isn't a lot of action and you don't have all this kind of fluff that masks, maybe shaky writing or shaky acting and, and the acting in that movie with Baldwin, Pacino, et cetera, is, is excellent. And that's kind of the, the overall draw of the movie to me. Well, do you, do, do we think that all of them were in, I mean, are you to believe that all of them were in on the break in or because, you know, for a while it was just the two of them talking and talking about it in the bar, but, 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 you know, and did they end up talking to the Jack Lemon character to get in on it? Or is that something he just did? Uh, was the pressure so great that they were all thinking about breaking in and stealing the leads and the Jack Lemon character is the only one that ended up doing it? I think what you just said is accurate. It was just the the latter, the one guy that did it, but it's been a while and I don't want to say something wrong because I'm sure somebody will correct me and say, actually, if you look at the Wikipedia to the, you know, whatever. So I, I think it was just the one guy, but I don't re- remember for sure exactly okay. what happened. Well, and everything, evidently that thing comes from like a play or something like that. Right. I mean, that, uh, uh, that, that, that story has a history, I guess. Okay, that makes sense. I I don't I don't know if I knew that, but okay. I mean I know Die Hard came from a book, so I mean okay. that that kind of all tracks to me. But overall, if you went all Roger Eber on me, how many stars would you give Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross? I you know and be I, honest, you I don't care. What yeah, you give I'd it. probably give it a six and a half or a seven. You know, okay. uh, just because, and maybe I'm missing maybe, maybe I missed something in there. You know, I, I guess if I understood it more, uh, maybe I I I I I thought the acting was great. You know. Uh, but just, I, I think the story, the, the not having the finality kind of kills it for me, I think. Okay. That's fair. Bull Durham. It was a good movie. I like that movie. This may sound blasphemous. I don't know why people think it's the greatest baseball movie of all time. To me, Major League and Moneyball were definitely better. Mm. Now, I'm a big Kevin Costner fan. I thought Costner was excellent in it, but the movie did get a little silly and a little, I don't want to say preachy, but definitely like. I don't know what the, what the phrase I want to use is, but it was a little campy or full, can't, it was a little full of itself. I don't know. Like the, 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 one of the early scenes when Costner's having that big long rant to what was her name? Annie about what he likes and stuff like that. Right. I mean, I get like the, like the, the smaller of woman, it. Back, woman, yeah, back. yeah like that, this that, that kind long of stuff. Yeah. monologue. It's like, all right, this seems a little over the well, top. I, 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 I think they were giving you that because they want, because they wanted to let you know he's, he was, you know, he, he, he has depth. You know, he's just right. not a jock. But they do it all in like three seconds. Right. Like, right. here's the part where we give him depth as opposed to organically doing it over the right. course of a movie. So the baseball stuff was excellent. I mean, it was a good movie overall. Costner's fantastic. The acting, I thought, was was really good. But to me, it's not uh, it's not my number one spot in terms of a baseball movie. Right. I think, you know, and it was it's obviously more more iconic to people older than you, I think, because of the time period, because it, it, it is kind of a. You know, it's believable that that time that that kind of stuff happened in the minor leagues, you know, uh, sure. more so, I think, than 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 today. And Crash uh, is based off a real guy that played right, the minors for right, a long time. Right. And I think because at, 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 at the time and all that it was more along the lines of, look, you know, that was something that you went to work the next day and, you know, everybody re- was reciting lines from it you know and i think that's what kind of kind of took it o- over the top and if you weren't part of that kind of synergy uh at the time uh i mean because it, it obviously is kind of a kind of you know uh, a classic and to some degree a cult classic you know I, I i guess to some you know it's a it's a widely popular and, and a lot of people view it as as, as the all-time best baseball movie 
you know, so let me let me poke a plot hole in here from a baseball question. How does Nuke go from a ball to the major leagues in one move? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, there are probably things in depth like that, you know, but I mean, uh, at the time, you know, hadn't have there been stories in the past of kids going that quick because they're just phenomenal, you know? I don't know. From from a ball to to the show, as they call it, they never say like I don't. I guess they couldn't say Major League Baseball or the majors even. I don't know. There's a licensing thing. They always mm. just called it the show. Mm. But I don't know if anyone's ever made that jump that immediately unless I don't, they came I, out of like high school or something. I don't. Yeah. I don't even know if I remember it being uh, worrying about. You know, that might be one of those things that that diehard baseball people poke holes in. So uh, I don't even remember that being that being ever a discussion. Uh, uh, at the time, so maybe right. that's just something. Well, I'm making it one <laughs> in, 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 in depth that that you know you poking the hole in it that way from. But I mean, yeah. I get it. I, uh, I I don't think you're supposed to dig that deep, you know. Well, I'm digging because that's right. what I did. So I'm worried. But, I mean, I know like occasionally didn't Bryce did Bryce Harper play in the minors at all? Maybe very briefly. I know like Xavier Nady, I think came straight from college to the to the majors, but in a ball to anyway, it doesn't matter. But but good movie. I would probably give it. Six six out of ten, probably okay. my ranking, but I think I know a lot of people hold it in higher regard. Right. Uh I yeah, once again, I, I might at some point have to rewatch the Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross just to see if I'm I missed something uh on it. Uh my, I might get my wife to watch it some I mean she likes uh, you know, uh Pacino and all, you know, she likes those older movies like that anyway. But she she had never even seen it either. So mm. uh I, maybe I'll get her to watch it and explain it to me. Or maybe if anybody listening, you know, can can kind of send me an email and break it down for me what I'm missing. You know I'm sure someone can. Know? And if they can, maybe it'll go from like a six and a half to you know nine. I don't know. But uh, anyway, in- interesting choice on, on your part. All right. Well, we've effectively killed off 10 minutes of the show, which tells you it's July 5th. But uh, we do have some Steelers news to talk about. Some actually worthwhile news came across my radar yesterday uh, before my 4th of July party got started. Pittsburgh rounding out their front office and their scouting staff with three new hires and two promotions. The three new hires as uh, reflected on the Steelers team website. Casey Weidel as a scouting coordinator, Chris Watts as a college scout, and Bronson Williams as a new scouting intern. The two promotions, Dennis McInnes promoted from Blesto Scout to Pro College Scout, and Fawaz Zudian promoted from scouting intern to Blesto Scout. And so Casey Weidel, probably the most notable name on this list, the brother of new assistant Steelers GM Andy Weidel. They worked together for several years in Philadelphia. Casey Weidel let go after the draft this year and now lands in Pittsburgh with his brother. Yeah, that 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 end of the move wasn't wasn't a bit surprising at all. And I think we wrote or talked about that uh, along the process here. You know, obviously the brother aspect of it. You could kind of see that one coming there. Man, we got a lot of new faces to learn before <laughs> we do <laughs> before pro days and all uh, get 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 underway. Hopefully more than anything, these guys will wear something with the Steelers logo on it that kind of makes it easy for them, uh, easier for them to be, uh, to be spotted. And I think over time, we'll we'll kind of be able to put, uh, you know, the faces with, uh, kind of rec, you know, uh, recognizing on, on command, if you will, kind of like the way that, uh, we got, you know, during the Colbert administration, if you will. Sure. And some background on Chris Watts. He was most recently the GM of the Pittsburgh Maulers, the USFL team. So I assume he's leaving that post there. Uh, He was a longtime scout, area scout for the New York Giants. He was covering, they said, the Midlands, which is kind of, I guess, mid-south region. I don't know if he's going to work kind of more in the south now that uh, Rick Reprish, Bruce McDorton are no longer with the team. Those guys cover the south and southeast pretty extensively. And then Bronson Williams, scouting intern, I had spent some time with the Jets last summer and most recently was working at Princeton. I think he still may be there and they're kind of allowing him to intern with with the Steelers this year. But sometimes those interns kind of stick. So we'll see what happens there. Matt Guinness has really risen up the ranks pretty quickly. He went from intern to Blesto Scout to probably replacing what Dave Pettit did with the pro college scout label and Azudian was hired a couple of years ago, initially, I think, at the virtual reality department and then became an intern and now a Blesto Scout, which is the one of two national scouting agencies in the NFL that kind of lays some of the groundwork to um, help the whole league begin their draft process. All right. Good info there. 
I don't Go know ahead. if I'd be attaching my name to the Pittsburgh Maulers <laughs> on my Fair. resume. Uh, uh, for sure. Uh, thoughts. Uh, did, did you watch the championship, uh, USFL championship game? I did not, but it sounded like a pretty competitive game. I saw some highlights after the fact. Yeah, I actually did watch it and I almost turned it off at halftime and I said, nah, well, uh, I, I won't really there. Well, I don't think there was much of anything else on, uh, so I watched it. It ended up being a pretty good game. I, you know, uh, I thought it was sad that the, uh, the stars, you know, lost that quarterback there. They, they started him out of court, uh, kind of a comeback. And I think even had, 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 had the lead there. And then they lost their, uh, their starting quarterback to a broken fibula. And then mm. the next quarterback comes in and throws a pick six. And that's when the game kind of got uh, out of hand, but, uh, there was a good, I don't know, probably a equivalent of a quarter there in the second half where it, it had become an, uh, quite interesting, uh, game, uh, kudos to them for making the USFO for making it all the way through, uh, just, uh, you, you know, the, I think the quarterback play just has got to get better, you know, more, more than anything. And I think that's been kind of the common theme with some of these leagues, right? Uh, uh, the football, I think USFL wise, now obviously I didn't watch every game every week kind of thing, but I, I did watch quite a few of them. I thought the football overall got better as the season progressed. Uh, but still, the quarterback play lead left a lot to be desired overall. And I, I just think the quality of play has got to get better if it's going to stick around. Sure. And I think they'll have to go out and expand into the home cities of these teams because, you know, no one was showing up for these games and understandably right. so. So there's going to be you know an extra cost in terms of the logis logistical travel of it all. But I think that you have to do that. But the ratings seemed OK and they got through a year, like you said, and that's something that a lot of leagues have not been able to accomplish. I think their intention is to return for 2023, and so we'll see what happens. Yeah, not a lot. You know, uh, Birmingham, Alabama, there's not a lot to, <laughs> to, to really drive. And I have yeah. been through Birmingham quite a bit. Uh, you know, not a lot to drive you to Birmingham, Alabama. So, uh, uh, yeah, they, they, they probably need to do a better job of getting this out into the cities now and at least trying to get uh get people in the stadiums uh, uh uh that way overall but i mean look they 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 made it a full season that's not i mean that's that that's a huge accomplishment accomplishment in and of itself i just think if they you know up the talent just a little bit more that that would obviously help but you know obviously if 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 if, if players play play in that you know they're probably close to or complete, obviously completely out of the NFL uh, uh, scope at that time. And maybe one or two of them will be able to break back into the NFL because of their play in, let's say, the USFL. Yeah, maybe it's I mean, could these guys play in the NFL this year? Could some of these guys go to a training camp after just going through a whole season, even contractually? Are they allowed I, 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 to go? Yeah, I, I think I saw something on that somewhere. I'll, I'll have to see if I find it. But I think after after the season is over, I think they can. I, I think there's something that says they can go. If I'm not mistaken, I don't know. How does your body hold up? You just played mm. the last four months. I don't know if you could make it through a whole season, but I mean, some of those guys certainly could. I mean, I remember J.C. Haas and I were came from what was it, the AAF yeah, or whatever. Right, right. Yeah, but they only I mean, made it through like what four or five weeks. True. So that's that's like a an equivalent to a training camp, I guess. True, you know? but I guess the point is, there's probably some talent there that's worth going back to the NFL. But I just wonder, can these guys hold up? I mean, that's a that's a tall task. But yeah, I mean, they survived, and again, that's more than most leagues have been able to to accomplish. Yeah, look, I mean, I I think there's a few of them, you know, uh, even the uh, who who was the MVP for uh, uh, Birmingham, uh, the wide receiver. I'm I'm not going to be uh, of much service here. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm trying. Victor Bolden Jr. Uh, He's from uh, Arizona State. He was a prospect coming out. Uh, I think there's a chance that uh, he, you know, he he. he you know, he and he could return and all like that. So I think there's a chance he makes it back to the NFL with, with some team in training camp this year. Yeah. I mean, I think he ran slow coming out of college. I think I remember about Victor Bolden and that kind of really tanked his stock, but sounds like he's got some talent and he'll probably get a look at mm -hmm. at some point. All right, Dave, you wanted to talk about the TJ Watt. I kind of have a couple of sack related questions. I know you have one as well. And so I think you're wondering out loud, can TJ Watt lead the league? in sacks for a third straight year, which apparently, and this was news to me in a very quality stat of the weird, no player has ever led the NFL in sacks three years running. Watt's done it each of the last two. 
and trying to make it three in a row. Yeah, and and that kind of prompted me to not only wonder if he could do it. I mean, because obviously back to back and and what he did last year and uh, the his age, you know, he's still you know viable and and doesn't seem to be showing any signs of slowing down. So I don't think the bigger question is whether he can lead the league three consecutive years. I guess my biggest question after after reading that that stat is if he if he is able to do it what does it do to his long-term prospects of let's say uh a hall of fame does if 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 tj watt is able to lead uh the nfl in sacks three consecutive years and also didn't you have the stat what's the what's the stat related to 18 or more uh sacks and 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 um uh, uh, who, who, uh, Reggie, Reggie White. What, what's the stat related to that? Um, is eighteen sacks? Did, didn't you, didn't you write up something that he could become the, the second oh, player along with with, with, with Reggie? ninety career sacks? I think within the players' first six seasons or something like okay. that. Okay, yeah. is is that what the is that what he's gunning for? I'd have to look to at my join, article again. But to that join sounds Reggie about White. Right. Okay, yeah, that sounds right. Uh, and. OK, let, let's say he does those two things, becomes only the second player to yada, yada, and then becomes the first player to record three sacks or, or to lead the NFL in sacks in, in three consecutive seasons. Does that make him a a slam dunk Hall of Fame, pro football Hall of Fame uh, uh, player, regardless of what he does from there on out? Or or is that not enough? So you're saying if he gets 18 sacks this year, that puts him in the Hall of Fame if he retired after the season? Is that what you're asking? Is that well? I mean, as long as he leads the, as if he leads the NFL in sacks for a third consecutive year, and okay. then whatever it is, whatever the amount that he needs to have to join Reggie White as the only other player in the, what whatever that stat was, it is 18. Had, yeah, okay. it is 18 to become the second player with 90 sacks after a player's first six seasons. Okay. So if he accomplishes those two things, and obviously he might need 18 or more sacks to lead the NFL uh, a third consecutive season. So let's assume he does both of those, both of those things. Is he, is he a slam dunk pro football hall of fame? Not if he were to hypothetically retire or stop playing after this season, but he's very much obviously on a first ballot Hall of Fame track. My thought and feeling is if he can have two and probably three straight more seasons of basically the pace he's on now, which around 20 sacks, making Pro Bowls, making all pros. If you do that for three more years, let's give the guy an extra 60 sacks. That's going to put him at about 130 in his career with what, six all pro appearances, seven all seven pro bowl, something like that. At that point, I think you're in that hall of fame status. So I don't think it'll come after this season, but it's going to further, you know, get him closer to that goal. And I think within two and three years, he'll be in that slam dunk hall of fame territory. Okay. So, so merely being the first player to lead the NFL in sacks three consecutive years, and at, at at the same time, become just the second player to record, was it 90 or more sacks in his first uh, six years, right? That's right. I mean, that's just a quirky stat that doesn't really mean a whole lot to, I'm sure, a potential Hall of Fame voter. But I mean, obviously, the pace he's on is unbelievable. And the fact you can even faithfully have this conversation as a dude enters year six is just okay. ridiculous. All right. So but 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 your your takeaway is it, it, it would not be enough. He would need to continue playing. No, because let, let, let's say he gets 20 sacks this year, leads the league. He's got 92 and a half career sacks, has made, what, four all-pro teams or whatever the number is. I mean, that's a really good resume. Is that Hall of Fame resume on its own if he retired and didn't play it down after that? I don't think so quite yet, okay. but he won't need a whole lot more to, to get to that point. Gotcha. The question that I had was, and I do pose it every single year, one of these years I think I'm going to be right, and I'll, I'll brag about it. Uh, can the Steelers' defense reach 60 sacks? They've been so close. They've led the league or tied for the lead league in sacks five straight years. They've been around. I think they had 55 sacks last year. They've always hovered around that mark. I think they got to as high as 56 a couple of years ago. Can this be the year? You had Ogan Joby to help replace to it. TJ Watt's numbers are off the charts. Alex Highsmith, his progression, Cam Hayward. 
et cetera, et cetera. Do you think no team has done it since what the 2013 Panthers, I believe, last team to hit 60 sacks? So it's it's a pretty rare feat done only three or four times this century. But can Pittsburgh join that group? Uh, I tell you, they need to join that group if this team's going to go anywhere this season. I I believe I think this defense has really got to play lights out in in 2022 to help offset what were you know, some unsavory things we're likely to see from the offense at times and some inconsistencies perhaps. And obviously this, this, this offensive unit being a lot younger, uh, a lot, a lot of newer pieces involved in it as well, too. Uh, will they can't, can they, uh, you know, the, a big portion of that, like it or not is you, you mapping out that TJ Watt hits 20 sacks and and I know you write that down twofold, thinking, yo, yeah, he can hit 20 sacks, but hitting 20 sacks is still a monumental thing, you know. Has any player ever done it uh, in consecutive years? I I I don't know. How has you answer that question for me? I, <laughs> I, I don't remember it. I don't think I'll have to look. I don't recall. I I don't know why or remember Bruce it, Smith. But- but it seems like uh, obviously sixty and twenty. I mean, that's a third of the sacks, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, uh, you've got a, you're going all in on on TJ Watt, and understandably so. I mean, why why wouldn't you? But uh, you know, twenty sacks is a lot of sacks, man. A lot of sacks, and uh, you know, for every one that that he doesn't get to to mit, you know, that misses that. That extremely, to me, hurts that number because he is such a, uh, a, and I imagine you did kind of stretch and and went more on a higher realistic scale with a lot of the predictions here, right? With these individual players, I mean, run through them. Cam Hayward, eleven sacks. I mean, that's obviously doable. But what what what's his in at his career high? His career high is twelve. I try to be actually more conservative with hmm. the sack totals and give myself you know, a little bit of play and not be so, because even Watt at 20, that's not, I wouldn't call that conservative, but it's fewer than what he had last year. Kim it's Hayward. still a third of your sacks. You yeah. Know? Right. But I mean, it's, I think it's a realistic number for him in a 17 game season. If he's healthy, Hayward, 11 sacks, he had 10 last year's career highs, 12 high Smith, seven and a half. That would be a career high, but he had what? Six, I think last year. And so that's, I think expecting him to make a jump and stay healthy. Open Joby, six and a half. The backup outside linebackers, because I didn't know what name to put down there. Three and a half sacks. Wormley with three. The guy had seven last year. Miles Jack, two and a half. Secondary with two. Liao, two. Alu Alu, one and a half. Adams, one. And Loudamilk, a half sack. That gets you to 61, just based off of those numbers. I think it's in. I think the way you have it mapped out, I think it's doable. But I, I also view this as a perfect storm. Sure. I mean, this means everyone has to stay healthy and play well, et cetera. But I mean, if you look at that list of names, what number is unrealistic for one of those guys to attain? I don't see one there. Uh, let's see. Leal, two sacks, I think is a little, little strong. He might not I mean, play, play much at all. Uh, I don't know. I, maybe you went a little light on Alu Alu, you know, uh, with, right. so with, you could with, with one and a half. Up. Uh, maybe divvy up some that way. Jack might, you know, uh, maybe maybe put Devin Bush in there uh, at at one and a half and and drop Jack down to one and a half because I think Bush may be more apt to be able to get after the quarterback than Jack. Uh, backup outline outside linebackers not named uh, Watt and Highsmith getting three and a half. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Maybe it'll add somebody here in the next couple of weeks. Make me feel better about that. I don't see Avery having, but maybe a half a sack. Tuska maybe one uh, if he's on the roster. Yeah, I, I have a hard time coming up with three and a half there. I mean, okay. obviously, look, I, I think, once again, I think the way you have it map, mapped out is not unrealistic. It just does feel like a... A, a a a a perfect storm scenario. Look, if they do hit sixty sacks, you you obviously would think that there's going to be a byproduct of that of maybe some strip sacks, right, and some turnovers. Uh, this defense 
I mean, this team in general could certainly use a 60 sack season with the way I envision the inconsistencies of this offense being. Yeah, I do have kind of two competing thoughts with that because the pushback I've gotten on this article, and it's a little bit and it's fine, but people will say, I don't care about sacks, just get me playoff victories. Well, I sit there and go, well, sacks create, you know, good defense and good defense helps put you in a playoff position. So, you know, teams that typically are successful have good pass rushes overall. And so there is, I think, a a correlation there. But at the same time, as I just said, this team has led or tied for the league league in sacks five years running, and what do they have to show for it? No playoff victories. And so if they hit 60, history says that they could do that, but it's yet to really actually result in uh, anything worthwhile come postseason time. Uh, Other than, you know, maybe getting in the playoffs, I mean, true or false, if this defense hits 60 sacks, the Steelers will be in a playoffs. Yes, I think it's a good indication for actually getting into the postseason, but that's not been Pittsburgh's issue. It's actually sure. advancing in the postseason. So it's a fair point. But how would you answer that question? I said yes. I think if okay. they get 60, they'll be in the playoffs, yes. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I have to look at the how, list. But how I, much further, how, how close can they, you know, how close do they need to come to that for them to get into the playoffs? Uh, probably be about in the range that they've been in in the mid and high fifties probably would make you feel like they, they could do it. I'm trying to think about the history of teams with 60 sacks. If they did get into the playoffs, I imagine they have, let me try to look up. I think it was Carolina in 2013. The Mm. last team that did it. Let me double check that. Yeah. They hit hit 60. What's concerned? What 50? I mean, the, uh, the Steelers obviously have been the ones to, uh, you know, that, that the last several years have, how many, how many of these years have they actually led the league? All of them, right? Five, five years running. I'm pretty five, sure. Five years running. They've, they've out, outright, uh, uh, led the league in sacks. One year, right? they, one year they tied for the league, uh, the lead league. Okay. I forget what year it was. And then obviously they did not make the playoffs in 2019, right? Uh, Right, the Ben year, yeah. Right, right, the Ben year there, but uh, and then they had fifty four that year, <laughs> and that's still not enough to get you in, right? Right. So I mean, it's not as clean of a correlation as you would like it to be, but you know, nineteen was a an exception given the injury at quarterback. I mean, once again, I I, I think you have laid this out from a um from a doable standpoint with each player, it just, it feels like for, for all of it to happen though, would have to be kind of a perfect storm. And what, oh, sure. you know, and what happens if White only hits, you know, uh, Oh, he only hit 16, 17 sacks. Uh, that's, that's three hard ones to try to make up, you know? Yeah. This would require Watt to probably reach at least 20 sacks. If he can't make up that third, like you talked about, they probably don't hit 60 unless something else right. crazy happens. Um, last team that hit 60 was the 13 Panthers. They went 12 and four, won the South that year. Okay. Did they win a playoff game? They did not. They lost in the divisional game. So who the heck knows? And by the way, your question or our question of, has there ever been a player to reach 20 sacks in consecutive years? Not for the official NFL books going back mm. to 82, but according to PFR, Deacon Jones in 67, 68 had 21 and a half in 1967, 22 in 1968, the only player to unofficially do it in two straight years. And and they played less games too. 14. So that, that head slap though, you could head slap people back then. So maybe it kind of, <laughs> kind of cancels out. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, look, I, I, I think for this, uh, and we've said this several times so far this off season and for this Steelers team in 2022 to make any noise, the defense is going to have to play a, a huge, huge part in that. And look, they, you know, they have the pieces there that, that, you know, potentially this could be a top, you know, five, seven defense in the NFL if they stay healthy. Sure. Again, from a pass rush perspective, that's never been a question for this team for years now, and I suspect it won't be again. And if you have some better run defense that puts defenses or offenses in third and long, et cetera, that should help the pass rush. I mean, it's crazy. This team got, what, 55 sacks last year despite a historically bad run defense. I mean, that's just hard right. to put those things together. So the fact that you even get back to average run defense, in theory, that should make your pass rush better. And I think, uh, look, you know, you got to have some of these sacks in, in the turnovers, I think. 
in takeaways. This offense right. is going to need that uh, in spades. All right, Dave, let's talk about one of those potential run defenders in Larry Ogunjobi. Jonathan Hightrader was back in the film room, uh, really trying to dial down and dial in Ogunjobi's run defense, which has been, I think, debated. You look at some of the PFF grades, they don't uh, grade him out too well overall. So Jonathan went to the tape to kind of look at some of those games where he did grade out well versus games he did not grade out well and try to come away with conclusions there. Um and I think Jonathan probably overall disagreed with the assessment that PFF gave him that Oak and is a real liability against the run. Yeah. And, and the way this kind of came about is it, it, you know, so many people run to PFF and look, once again, uh, this is not a knock on PFF. Uh, I utilize them a lot. I think they do a great job with a lot of different things uh, that they track and chart and all like that. Uh, I think, though with the grading not not being fully I still don't fully understand all aspects of their grading okay and and I've done you know I've I've I've, I've been a subscriber of theirs since 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 day one uh here but I think the lazy what, what we've seen in this industry now is people lazily run to Pia instead of watching the tape they say well all right uh I'll just go look at his grades and I'll get a good idea of, of, of who the player is. And if you look at Larry, Larry Ogunjobi's run grade, run defensive grade, uh, just last year alone uh, on, on PFF, that instantly, I think, has set into action that he sucks against the run. And uh, now, immediately after he was signed, I watched, I think, right right around 200 snaps of his. Uh, I was not overly choosy, I don't think, on the games that I pulled there. But my, my main takeaway was I thought he was pretty decent against the against the run and that I thought that the one of the main things that might be something that that, that someone might have issue with his play against the run was his miss what was some missed tackles overall. So what we what what we thought was the proper course of action there was to take to let Jonathan uh, you know try to do it as a, an objective dive on him as possible uh, with the notion that we would look at his best graded run defense grade uh, of, of, uh, of 2021, his worst run defense grade, uh, game of 2021 and two of his middle, uh, graded games. And so we pulled the all 22 tape on all those. And that's, that's what he used to look at now overall. And I think in just the, uh, uh, and I think he only got to three games. I don't think he got to the Packers game uh, as, as part of that study, uh, which was uh, your second middle game there. But I think we're only talking about like what forty something, forty something run snaps in total. Is that what the number was? I think it was. Hold on here, just a minute. Across uh, those three games that he looked at. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, I guess because they were against what the Chiefs, the Chargers some pass happy teams so the Baltimore not a lot of run snaps against the Ravens uh let's see here he did the game against the Chiefs which was I believe week 17 that was 10 snaps there uh he did the game against Baltimore I think from earlier uh week seven mm-hmm. 12 run snaps there so we're up to what 22 run snaps and then the other game was can't uh, the 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 Chargers was his weakest game. Uh, that was week thirteen. He had fifteen run snaps there. Okay, so just about forty. All right, well, right. Those were so, the games. I mean, th- those were the games. But I mean, uh, is that enough? Enough? Uh, you know, is that enough? I mean, Jonathan had looked at him before in that right. initial breakdown. So, I mean, he's looked at, you know, more snaps in just these three games, too. Right. A- exactly. But anyway, I thought his takeaway was my, 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 my thoughts on him still hasn't changed. And I, and I think a lot, once again, I thought that a lot of the negative related to him was 
missed tackles. Right, and I think Jonathan talked about some of that. I mean, his overall conclusion, if I can try to find, uh, let's see, says, uh, sure, I do agree that Okunjobi needs to be more consistent at getting ball carriers to the ground and hold his own better with more sound gap integrity anchor, but a lot of the plays above need to be taken in the context, which he does throughout the article. I mean, he's going to be more of a penetrating type. He just, you know, don't expect this guy to be a big old school nose tackle. He's not going to play in that style. That's not the way that he wins, and if you accept that fact and understand that reality, then I think you, you'll use him effectively. Right. Uh, so look overall, and, and I think it comes back to the main issue or my main question when it comes to Ogan Joby, I, I think it true or false. It's unfair to, to, to flat out say Ogan Joby sucks against the run. True. I agree. I think true. Now, is he, is that going to get him to the pro bowl? Probably not. But uh, I think he's a more than adequate run defender for the style of, of, of what he's been asked to do. Uh, I, the biggest issue, I think, with him is, is going to be the health aspect. If, if they get the guy uh, that was playing the way he was playing prior to suffering that foot injury, I, 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 I think they're going to be fine. If they don't, and if that thing becomes an issue, well, then there's your issue. Right. I mean, that, that is the million dollar question, the health of that foot. I mean, I would like to think he'll be good to go by the time week one starts and even camp. He should be pretty healthy, but he did mention that interview last week with uh, Sirius that he's still rehabbing. But what does that mean? He's 90 percent. Does that mean he's 75 percent? I don't know. I don't know what stage of the rehab he's in right now. Again, obviously, he passed the physical Pittsburgh comfortable enough to sign him and, and the doctors cleared him medically. But um, you know, if he's good to go week one or day one of training camp, July 27th, I think that's a good sign. If he's on the sidelines to start camp on pup, if that happens, then there may be some concerns there. Right. And that's one thing that we're just going to have to wait to find out. They, they have not done a, uh, you know, I think Sirius is really the only interview that he's given since he signed with the Steelers. I haven't seen anything else. They didn't do a, uh, I, I kind of figured they would have done a zoom press conference or, or something with him. That didn't happen there. So we're going to really literally have to, I think, wait for these next three, three and a half weeks or whatever it is and wait till he gets to training camp to find out if he's a full go when training camp opens or if he has to start on, on the active PUP or what, you know? Sure. So we'll see, but overall I'm still happy with the signing. I mean, sure. I, I assume you are as well. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, once again, I mean, if he, if they, if they got the player uh, that was playing prior to the game against the Raiders where, he, where when he went down and I, I, I think they're going to be fine. Now, once again, I, I don't think he's, you know, a lot of, I think 700 snaps is kind of the max for him overall. I, ideally, you'd like to be able to have enough good rotation where maybe you could limit the snaps on him to, I don't know, 550, 600, right around in there. Uh, but, I mean, I think if push came to shove and you needed him on the field for 700 snaps, you you you, you could definitely do that. But I think, uh, I think the sum – it, 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 uh, when it comes to his defensive line can potentially be greater than the parts. Well said. How many snaps did he play last year? Because he was healthy all last year. Well, I think he played 16 games before the foot injury in the playoffs. He played, according to PFR, 724 snaps last year. Okay. So I think if you get around 600, 650 is a good number for him. Okay. I, um, I, 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 you know, I just don't think you want to push him as hard. Yeah, I get that. No, I understand that. And and, and they shouldn't have if, if this group stays healthy. I mean, we talk about the depth there. Um, there should be enough of a rotation where you can mix and match these guys and keep players fresh. OK. All right, Dave, let's switch to your 90 and 30 series as you're you're getting close to the end of that thing, aren't you? I actually am. I think I only got about four or five days left. All right. Good deal. But we'll power on through with the guys that we have not talked about yet, starting with Deontay Johnson, Tyree Johnson, and Carl Joseph. So Deontay Johnson, obviously the big question with him heading into the summer is, can and will he get a contract extension? We've talked about that ad nauseum, so I don't know how much you want to go down that rabbit hole again. I'm sure we'll discuss it more throughout training camp as he gets talked about it, and there may be some rumors and reports that signal a deal may or may not happen. To the player himself, Again, I think this guy had a really strong 2021 season. It was just marred a bit by some of the drop issues towards the end of the year, including the wild card loss to Kansas City. But big picture to me, 
Johnson made very real and strong steps forward last season. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. He did. And the thing with him, that's going to be the biggest focus in, in especially uh, under the microscope with, with, with Steelers fans is uh, the drops. Uh, this is a guy. And, and also for the advanced analytics is the average depth of target. Now uh, I think, you know, Ben Roethlisberger had quite a hand in that average depth of target, not being where you wanted it to be along with kind of, you know, what he was asked to run as far as uh, routes and, 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 and along those lines. Uh, we have seen a guy though, that when he does catch the football uh, is a very good route runner, in my opinion, uh, and a guy that can separate uh from defenders off the line and press coverage. And I think he does a good job also of separating with the football in the air on down the field. We just haven't seen enough of that. And look, you go back to e e e even kind of his rookie season there. This is a guy that, that has shown that he can get vertical and win that way. We just haven't seen him asked to that be asked to do that uh, a lot, especially since his rookie season there. So, um, uh, I like Deontay Johnson. I think he's a bit underrated, uh, even so, as, as a wide receiver. And, you know, I think if he stays healthy and if they utilize him correctly, I, I think another 90, you know, 90 catch uh, 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 season could be in the cards for him. Yeah, I mean, in terms of a route runner, route runner, I think he's probably about a top eight, top ten route runner in football. I mean, not in that upper, upper tier of maybe Diggs and Adams and guys like that, but but right up there. And, you know, again, the drops, that's the thing everyone loves to talk about. They weren't an issue at all in the first 12 weeks of last year. Everyone talked about, and rightfully so, how he kind of fixed those things. And it was more of an issue down the stretch, but take it, you know, Big picture, his drop rate was super low, but this guy's twitchy. He's athletic. I think he has good hands and great body control. I mean, he, the catches he made against Buffalo week one, the Chargers game, that primetime event, that left corner of the end zone, made some really high degree of difficulty catches. So his hands are really strong. They're just the occasional lack of focus because he is so hell-bent on getting upfield because it's been such a yak type of offense overall, but he has proved his ability to win vertical. You look at the back-to-back -back weeks, week four, week five against the Packers and Broncos, had a pair of, what, 45-yard touchdowns early in that game running vertically. And so this guy, you know, whenever there's good vertical throws thrown his way, can can make those catches downfield. So to me, this guy can run every single route, make all the big plays, um, and is a really hard worker and a pretty humble, low-key dude. And so there's a lot of good there with Deontay Johnson. And I think where you, you know, you need to, need to expect to probably not have the results that you desire is sometimes when you, uh, those quick slants, you know, over the middle has seemed to be the biggest problem, uh, with him where, where he kind of alligator arms it at times. Mm -hmm. And, and where you know, uh, the drops with him obviously come closer to the closer to the line of scrimmage, uh, there and, and, and maybe lacks the focus and the concentration. And, and, you know, another aspect sometimes is I think he may tries to make things happen. I think he tries too hard to make some things happen sometimes after catching the football, especially when running towards the middle of the field, instead of immediately turning up with the football kind of, you know, running back, back, mm -hmm. you know, the, the other way. And it's kind of got himself in trouble uh, that way. Look, when you drop the amount of balls that he's dropped, it's, it's a lot easier to keep piling on him and finding these other things. If he didn't have the drop issue, though, I don't think we'd be talking about uh, about a lot of the things with him other than maybe the average depth of target slash reception, which I'm not 100% convinced is entirely his fault, obviously. Uh, the ball came out in Pittsburgh really, really quick the last couple of years. I would like to see this guy just be used more in in different route trees and 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 allow him to go vertical more because I think if you give him six eight nine more vertical catches down the field that will take care of the average depth of target average depth of reception numbers. Sure, and let me pull up a stat here 
really quickly because I think perception and reality can be two different things. I know drops can be a subjective number overall, but according, do, you, do you know what uh, Deontay Johnson's drop rate was last year according to PFR? Oh, I don't remember off the top of my head. Th- 3%. You want to take a guess what Pat Fryermuth's drop rate was last year, according Uh-oh. to PFR? Four percent, two and a two and a half percent. Okay. So, then again, you could argue some different stuff in the playoff game, et cetera. Um, and obviously, I'm Pat Fryermuth has better hands than Deontay Johnson overall. Right. But the point is, I mean, a couple of drops late in the season, all of a sudden, Deontay Johnson—that's the only thing people rem- remember about his entire year, despite playing a full season and playing excellent football overall. Yeah, and they, 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 with him, they do seem to come in, in bunches, right? Yeah, I think so. I think there's a little bit of in his head type stuff. Um, but again, it, it was not as bad as people think it was last year. And, and to the other point about the average depth of targets, you're right. To me, that's, that's no fault of his own. He's the X receiver. He's going to run probably some more shallow routes. He's not the vertical clear out guy like a Chase Claypool um, is asked to be, but it's the way the offense is constructed as well. And frankly, if you look at from week one to week, 14 last year this is not an average depth of target though i imagine it was higher but his average yards per catch was 12.2 and then the offense really went in the super mega dink and dunk mode and so the for the final four games of the regular season his his, um, yards per reception dropped to 6.6 and it was a very similar number for the wild card loss so until the offense really went in the hyper throw short mode his yards per reception was respectable uh, and look, how quickly can he get on the same page with, you know, Trubisky or, you know, whoever winds up, you know, uh, uh, being the quarterback uh, this year, you know, uh, that that's obviously going to be be part of this as well, too. But I if he stays healthy, uh, I mean, it's it's hard to imagine him not hitting at least at least 90 receptions, I I would think. And, you know, if his yards per reception uh, gets back up let's say closer to 12, where I think it should be 12, 12 and a half. I mean, you're going to be over a thousand yards, right? If you just do the math on that, what is 90 times 12.3? What does that come out as? That's 1107. So should, should easily do it. Right. So, uh, that that's what I and obviously you know, c- c- hopefully can control the drops. Hopefully can uh, have some uh, uh, some more catches down the football field. Uh, do a little bit you know more consistent job at, at after the catch. He's there's nothing wrong with him. It's just is he uh, to me you know and and that's what the question is. Is he he's not an elite wide receiver at least not yet. Especially coming out of the the. Uh, uh, the 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 uh, Antonio Brown years, right? So with that, you know, he's he's not elite, and that's the biggest thing of wondering, you know, what what kind of player he can be, and if he's worth that kind of money. I don't disagree with the assessment. You know, I think he's about a top twelve receiver in football. But let me just ask you openly: what makes him? What is he missing to become that elite receiver? What does he have to do to get into that tier? I, I think you got to have more yards, man. I think you got to have more yards and less drops. And, do you, uh, do you I, think I, the I, yards are hurt though because he's not getting the chances to win vertically the way that a Devontae Adams or a Cooper Cup? Oh maybe? yeah, look, I, it's not that I don't think he can do it. I think he just needs to do it in a season, though. You know? Sure. No, I get that. I mean, you got to prove it. But I think when your quarterback has a two point two snap to throw time, it's hard to get those big down sure. plays. Sure. I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not disputing that as all uh, at all. So the the elite part of his game that he's missing really isn't his his own fault. Right. But we got to see it in a season, though. Sure. You know? No, I understand that. Right. No, I, I mean, it's all good in theory, but until you actually do it, you really can't call yourself that that elite guy. Last thing on Deontay Johnson. Want to wish him a happy birthday. Today's mm. his birthday, apparently. T- turn in the big 2-6. So I think he'll be wishing for a new contract when he blows out the candles. Yeah, good luck with that. Uh, <laughs> we'll have to see how that, that obviously goes. And uh, has the Terry McAuliffe uh, uh, contract hit? Yeah, I do not know. Uh, on the holiday, probably not. But I, I don't didn't, know. I didn't see it when I looked. Uh, yesterday, the day before, and with the holiday and all, yeah, I don't, don't think league offices were open yesterday, so I I doubt it's actually hit the books yet. 
but has, you tell me. Uh, no, McLaren, McLaren uh, has not hit yet. Okay, I'm sure that'll happen by the time we talk on Friday. All right, Dave, let's move on to Tyree Johnson, undrafted free agent, pass rusher, edge rusher out of Texas A&M. Don't know, obviously, a whole lot about him. Had some good production in the SEC, but beyond that, have to get eyes on him starting the one at training camp. Yeah, look, uh, that's that's going to be the biggest thing with him is there is a roster spot, I think, to be had uh, with him. Just how quickly can he... Uh, grasp onto this thing, the defensive concept. Can he become a special teams asset uh, very, very quickly uh, that, that look, I mean, they're, they're probably, I mean, at max, they're going to keep six, I mean, five outside linebackers, I think. Right. I mean, it'd be pretty unreal, uh, un, unprecedented if they kept uh, uh, more than five outside linebackers. Right. Sure. It's going to be four or five. I project them to carry five inside linebackers, so it's more likely than not they carry four, but it could be five just based on the performance of that group. I mean, he absolutely, I think, will need them to carry five, at least five for him to have a shot at this thing as, as long as everybody stays healthy. Uh, look, the, the outside linebacker depth chart as we sit here on July 5th leaves a lot to be desired, in my opinion, behind the obvious that's not a that's not a diss at at Watt or Alex Highsmith uh those guys are fine where we're back in the same spot though what as almost identical to last year uh what is going on behind those guys last year it ended up being Taco Charlton and and obviously Melvin Ingram but Melvin Ingram didn't didn't hang around too terribly long uh, uh unfortunately uh this year I mean, everybody knows how I feel about Jannard Avery at this point. Liked him as an off-the-ball linebacker. I think he can play on the edge outside and help you as a run defender. I just don't think he's going to give you much of anything as a pass rusher on the outside. I I would welcome him to prove me wrong and have four or five, six sacks, you know, in, uh, in whatever, you know, uh, based on whatever limited time that he plays. Uh, Derek Tuska, you know. Is, is he even going to make, make, make the roster this year? Uh, somebody's got to be that number four, number five. Uh, I'm just not convinced Tyree is going to have enough time to be that guy, though. And he really would have to, I think, show something on special teams, especially if they only kept four. Mm-hmm. And I kind of wonder if we're looking at either him or TD Moultrie, whoever kind of wins it out as being that, that, that young outside linebacker uh, on the practice squad in 2022. Sure. It's an uphill climb for Johnson, for all those guys, but here's the blueprint. The blueprint is very much laid out for you. It's very recent. Look at Shamir Jones last year. No one talked about Shamir Jones this time a year ago. That was, everyone was talking about Melvin Ingram, the veteran Quincy Roche gets drafted, thought that was a great value pick in the sixth round, which it was. And then Jameer Jones comes on and has a great preseason in terms of his pass rush and really was an excellent special teamer during the summer and compelled Pittsburgh to keep him. Obviously he didn't end the year with the team, but I think he won his ring with the Rams. And so it all kind of ended well for him. But if you're Tyree Johnson, you're TD Moultrie, you say, man, a guy just made it last year in a very similar position outside looking in, do what he did and you'll have a shot. But it's got to come through special teams aspect of it. Mostly. Right. It does. It does. Especially knowing that people hate to hear that when they listen to this podcast, you know, Every year, you guys put too much emphasis on special teams. Well, it's not us putting the emphasis on it. It's the historical aspect of this team and really overall uh, uh, of the NFL. I mean, like it or not, these guys, you know, 52 to, I mean, not 52, uh, uh, 47 to 53 on on the 53-man roster, uh, better have some special teams assets to them or they're not going to make it. Right. That's how a lot of these guys have been able to stick at Derek Tuska stuck because of, of that ability. Robert Splane got his first, you know, calling due to that. Even Heinz Ward way back when Brett Kiesel was running down punts like way, way back when. So, I mean, that's the pass. A lot of these guys start off with. And so that's what Tyree Johnson will have to do. But if he can prove that pass rush ability as well, this team does not have the slam dunk number three option they did last year in Melvin Ingram. So there might be an opportunity there as well. It's a very 
there's a lot of guys there. There's a lot of cooks in that kitchen, but can anyone actually cook? I mean, how good is the food? And so that that's the question there. Uh, I, I, I do worry about the outside linebacker uh, depth again, because I mean, man, it'd be nice to, and look, I know it's like pulling teeth to get, get Watt off the field. And I understand that with, with, with good reason. Uh, but you got to be able to cycle through. You got to at least be able to have one guy come off that bench and in a pinch give you 30 snaps if you need it in a game. Sure, you do. And I, right they now, don't, I don't, they don't know. Have that, who that, they don't have that guy right now, I don't think. Yeah. I mean, I think right now, Avery's your number three because he's the more veteran option that can play some good run defense. But I understand that's not your ideal number three. Right. All right, finally, let's finish up this section with Carl Joseph, who was spent last year mostly on the practice squad, got a couple of cups of coffee with the team, played just a handful of defensive snaps last year, um, has a new number, had his number taken away, finally switched to eight, then Kenny Pickett gets drafted. And so Joseph, don't know, forget what number he has now, but it's not number eight. And so he'll be trying to compete for that last safety spot uh, come this summer. Yeah, and good luck with that. I mean, uh, you, you, there are certain ways I guess you could draw this thing out and him uh, uh, make it, but this is a guy that's, that that's, has seemingly had one foot out of the league now for, for a few seasons now, and you have to wonder what it would. To me, it really feels like it's going to take an injury with him. Uh, ahead of him on the depth chart for him to make the 53 man roster. I don't think he's, 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 he's considered uh, a special teams dynamo. If you will uh, look, you have uh, uh, miles Killebrew, who is kind of that guy uh, special teams ace on the roster. And he's more of a uh, strong safety type. Um, you got Killebrew. I mean, not Killebrew, uh Casey, uh, who's another player on this roster that was signed during the offseason, uh, kind of a jack-of-all-trades, if you will, kind of Swiss Army knife as far as being able to move him around. You obviously re-signed Edmonds this offseason. It just it feels like a big – it feels like something has got to happen for Carl Joseph to, 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 to make this roster uh, as a backup safety. Yeah, like you said, injury is probably going to be the main thing that would help him help that spot get created. So we'll see. Um, veteran guy, though, that's going to help him. Um, being with a team throughout an entire camp, that's going to help him as well. And he's wearing number 38. And so that is his new number, 38. All right, All right let's move on to the next 90 and 30 section with, as you just spoke of him, a couple of safeties here. DeMonte Casey signed over from... Dallas this past year, right after literally, literally hours after the draft ended, Casey got signed to a one-year contract. Just kind of wonder how much is left in his tank. He was with Dan Quinn last year. Dan Quinn kind of helped bring him over from Atlanta. If Dan Quinn saying we got to move on, that's not a great sign to me overall. But someone that can hopefully be really versatile, playing probably primarily free safety and slot corner, but in theory could play some strong safety as well. Yeah, I think what you have in him is you have a jack of all trades and a master of none. Uh, and you can move him around quite a bit. It's going to be interesting to see what his actual role is. Is he a guy that you're going to have? Uh, is he going to be be on the field in dime? I mean, he can play in the box, right? I mean, uh, quasi linebacker, you know, uh, he can play in the slot. He can play deep. It's just. What what position has been his best overall in the NFL? And it's it's really hard to answer. Yeah, I think he's played mostly a lot of slot corner and some free safety. He's a big hitter. Again, I remember I love this guy coming out of San Diego State because he's he's a Mike Hilton type of dude where he's one of the smallest guys on the field, but but hits like a linebacker. And so I don't really see him as playing that dime linebacker role, but you know, kind of like the way that the trade Norwood was used last year. But the issue is Norwood's probably gonna con- continue to get playing time probably a better cover player at this point in his career than Casey. So it's good quality depth though, and a versatile piece and injury strike. Casey can plug a lot of spots. Uh, I mean, he's uh, pretty boring injury with him. It, it feels like he, he's obviously a slam dunk, right? To, to, to make the roster. Uh, I, I don't know. I would call, I wouldn't call him a slam dunk or a lock. I mean, I had to, I'd have to look at the roster construction a bit more, but if this guy just looks kind of old, for lack of a better word, come come the summer. I mean, I could see this guy not making it. Okay. 
So. But I mean, uh, pr- probability wise, a high probability then. I haven't thought about it too much, to be honest. I think he's inside looking out. I think it's better than 50%. But, you know, th- there's a lot of competition there with Norwood. I mean, if, if Trey Norwood can do everything that Casey can do, then what's the point of having DeMonte Casey? Okay. And how much can this guy play on special teams at this point in his career? I, I, I generally don't know what his snap totals there uh, last year were. Yeah, I, I, I put here Casey has position flexibility, has been in the NFL for several years now during training camp, figures to compete against Edmonds for the right. Uh, I mean, is it out of the question that he could be the, 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 the starting strong safety? I mean, obviously, Edmonds is penciled in for that spot. We expect Edmonds to be that spot. But is it unthinkable that that, that Casey winds up as as the week one strong, starting strong safety? Is it I would to- be- totally unthinkable? I would be very shocked if Terrell Edmonds was not the starting strong safety week one. I right, could he ultimately, I mean, and that's, I mean, it, but is it unthinkable? I mean, is 5% unthinkable? I mean, I don't know how that's, that's the answer I would kind of give you in okay. terms of Casey being that guy. So to me, short answer, yes, but I mean, I, I'm not going to make it a 0% chance. I suppose. Do you view him as, as, as more probability wise of ultimately wind up being the first safety off the bench in 2022 and a player using some dime packages? I mean, I'm just trying, let's map out the dime defense. I mean, let's, you have your, let's assume Edmonds is your starting strong safety. It's Patrick at free safety. Let's just call. You know, your three corners, however you want to line them up, Witherspoon, Wallace, Sutton, that leaves one guy left for dime. Is that going to be Casey? I, I think it's going to be Trey Norwood. Okay. Do you think it's going to be Casey? I mean, I, 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 that's what I'm interested to see. And, yeah. and, and I think I even put in here, interesting to see what kind of role. Uh, in fact, here's the paragraph here. The expe- expectations are that Casey will be on the 53-man roster in 2022. And assuming that winds up happening, it'll be interesting to see what kind of role he winds up playing. Uh, he did play 57 special team snaps for the Cowboys in 2021 as a member of their kickoff coverage team. So we might see him log a similar amount of playing time for the Steelers in 2022 in that same capacity as well. So I, I am kind of interested to see which way the Steelers do go with the dime here. Yeah, I, I, I think it'll be Norwood, but we'll see. I mean, Casey's a more experienced guy, so we'll just have to. I'm just I just worry, you know. From what my Cowboys buddy said, he played a lot last year, but didn't play particularly well a year out from that torn Achilles he suffered in Atlanta. And I just and wonder. That, that's all. That's a bad injury to have, yeah. too. We've talked yeah. about that several times uh, over the years. Uh, you know, are our players ever the same again, especially defensive backs and wide receivers? You know, when it when it when it comes to that, it seems like the answer is no. Uh, but right. he will be a further, further year removed. Right. So, um, I mean, it's going to be, it. We'll, we'll get an idea, I think, or you will get an idea during training camp, what his kind of, how his mobility is. And if you mm-hmm. can see any signs of that. Again, I know Mike Tomlin talks about, we don't care how you got here, but if Dan Quinn really liked his play last year of Casey, why didn't they just resign him? I mean, True. what, what happened? Minimum. I mean, yeah, he would have been there cheap. Right. I mean, you're not. You're not talking about breaking the breaking the bank for this guy. Yeah, because again, Quinn was this guy in Atlanta, brought him over to Dallas after he got hurt in 2020, and then said, "Eh, he started 15 games for him," and just said, "Now we don't like what we see, and we're going to let you let you walk." And so that's to me a red flag. Okay. Another safety here, Miles Killebrew, who was the backup strong safety last year, played in some select kind of big safety packages that third safety rotation against some you know 13 personnel but primarily a special teamer best known for the two blocked punts he had last year really seemed to thrive under Danny Smith hashtag Danny Smith forever. And so that should be his role again in 2022. Yeah. This is a guy that's currently wearing Danny Smith's letterman jacket. I think, you know, where can uh, I get one of those? <laughs> can I borrow it? Miles, if you're listening, uh, look, right when this guy was signed initially last year, we, we knew what it was for. And it ended up being, he ended up being just what they needed him to be. Uh, and they will continue, con- will continue to need him to be that same guy at least one more season. Obviously, we signed him to a two year, uh, four million dollar contract back in March. Something I think we both predicted was, was going to happen. Uh, not a guy that you want on the field playing a lot of defensive snaps for you, but can can get you through an end of the ball game kind of situation, I guess. 
But this guy is in there because he can get down the field and make tackles on special teams, and he can occasionally get through a gap and block a punt for you or two. And they need that from him again. As part of the Steelers' goal to make the, you know, to win, maybe win the division or at, at very least just win the playoffs by any means possible, it will take a couple of block kicks or three throughout the season on top of everything on top of the, the defense playing well. So he should make the 53 man roster barring injury as a core special teams player. And hopefully he delivers what he delivered in 2021 and maybe even a little bit more in 2022. Just look at the impact his block punts had last year. Week one against Buffalo, Pittsburgh was not looking good in that game. I think people forget that. And that block punt in that fourth quarter was one of the you know turning points of that game. It might have been the turning point that Tyler Wise wrote about that, that helped turn the tide and got Pittsburgh uh, an upset win in week one. And then the Chargers game ultimately did not win, but that really spurred the comeback bid that Pittsburgh had. And so, man, you create splash in special teams, whether that's a block punt, block kick, long return, et cetera, that can really be the the winning edge to to get you a victory. Yeah, look, uh there there's going to have to be some ugliness mixed in uh this year uh with 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 that ugliness being on the Steelers side of football that produces turnovers, you know, takeaways. Yeah, yeah. And, right. and it's not and, just defense, it's special teams right, takeaways as well. Right. Absolutely. I mean, so he, look, he, he's a gritty player. I mean, I, I definitely like him on the Steelers side. Yep, and now in terms of his actual defense ability, he can be kind of a, a true, true box guy even more than Edmonds. Don't ask him to play in space ever. Right. If that ever happens, there's problems. Right. Finally on this list here, Christian Kuntz, who uh, won the long snapping job last year, beating out Cameron Canada. Right, that was last year, right? Yeah. I think so. Yeah, I'm getting my, my years all mixed up here. And seemed to do well, despite uh, having a new holder, new long snapper. Chris Boswell was excellent. Um, the snaps all look good. I don't recall one, you know, obviously noticeably bad snap. I'm sure there were some that were, I think there was a couple that maybe were a bit low, but made it through the season. And so he, he'll, he'll, he'll be the, the favorite entering his second year with the team. I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and, and, and pretend like we, we, we break down uh, long snappers on a weekly basis or anything like that. I think the biggest thing is uh, if you're not talking about your long snapper on a uh, uh, much of any throughout a season, things have gone well. Uh, and less other than talking about, boy, he got down there and made a special teams tackle. But even then, that's, that's kind of a negative if you're needing your, your, yeah. your long snapper to get down there to uh to to make a special teams tackle there uh i think a m- more realistic is the occasional they let the long snapper down the punt at the two yard line mm-hmm. uh uh k- kind of instance maybe maybe that's not a bad thing there but uh uh anything more than that you're talking about him too much uh look here here's the good thing about it is in a pinch, this guy can play outside linebacker. <laughs> we knew you were going to say that. <laughs> don't even start. You know, you don't want to have to go there, but if you have to go there, you can go there with this guy. This guy actually got a uh, a sack in a preseason game as an outside linebacker. So right, against Carolina. I think his outside right. linebacker days are done. And I should correct myself. Second year as the long snapper, he was with the team prior to that in camp. And as you said, as that outside linebacker. But uh, he was not wearing the defensive jersey right. last year in camp. So I think his pass rush days are through. Right, right. But, I mean, hey, the more you can do, the, you know, the more you can do, right? <laughs> well, we ju- one we just exception don't to that. see it. Right. Yeah. Uh, leave that to the to the theory and not, not the practice. But he should. he's the only long snapper, I believe, in camp. I they, believe uh, so, they, right. They released Rex Sunahara, which I was kind of hoping to see. That was like a weird... Six seven dude, former volleyball player. I was kind of remember that old that kid from uh, Hawaii years ago that uh, uh, who was who uh, that used to do the trick snapping and thought maybe he was going to be the guy that that ended up running. Uh, who was it? Greg Warren out of town. That sounds familiar. Um, he was uh, a defensive player too, wasn't he? Kind Jake, of looked- Jake Ingram. Remember him? Mm, I do remember. Was he? In, he was in a camp, obviously, for a summer, I guess, was his story. Yeah, but but uh, he got snapped. I mean, it seemed like he got gone a lot quicker than than what, what, what was imagined at the time. Okay. 
Let's talk about some Steelers long snappers. Who are the best ones? It's Greg Warren. I think it was Mike Schneck. It was Jake. No, no, you're right. No, you're right. right. Yeah, that sounds right. Okay. No, you're, you're correct. But yeah, Greg Warren. I was thinking back to that Packers game when they, you know, that great throw to Mike Wallace at the uh, it says seconds tick down. Then you had just have the long st- or the extra point, which was supposed to be this easy thing. And Warren t- tears oh, yeah. his ACL, or, uh, ACL and just what a, what a crazy moment that was. But yeah, him, Mike Schneck, two of the best long snappers. I'm trying to think. I wrote an article about the Steelers' first true long snapper a while back. I'll have to go back and find who that guy was because it used to be just the centers. But like, mm-hmm. Mike Webster would, would long mm-hmm. snap for them and, and be the guy, and then eventually he got too old. So, uh, in that, terms of this, and that old story, people don't like Bill Belichick, but he tells some great stories about how long snappers. You know, there's a video floating around uh, uh, Bill Belichick talking about the history of the long snapper. Yeah, which is it's just really good. So in, in in Pittsburgh this year, Christian Kuhn's really the only guy in terms of a backup emergency situation. I'd probably suggest John Leglue. He was working on some long long snap stuff last year, so that may be your uh, closest thing to a backup long snapper. Alex, I'll take things I don't want to see in a Steelers <laughs> game uh, in 2022 for 500, please. Can't be worse than James Harrison. How did Harrison ever get tasked with being the backup snapper? I wonder, did he ever talk about how that conversation came up? How he I, was I ever think, I think it's work? been, I, 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 over the years, I think something like that, a, a story has, I will have to go back and research that. Okay. Maybe that, maybe that's something for some off season fodder for you here moving forward. Good call. Good call. All right, Dave, I think that's going to wrap up, wrap up the 90 and 30 series. Um, let's see what else is there to talk about. Had an interview posted this morning on Steelers Depot with Chris Owens, rookie undrafted offense lineman. We'll talk about in your 90 and 30 a little bit later on in the month. Uh, really good guy, really good interview overall, and playing mostly guard right now after he was basically a center, a bit of right tackle as well at Alabama, uh, but Pittsburgh's trying to get him at guard. But could he be the new John LeGlue? Mm. guy that makes his way onto the roster and that's that's possible yeah we'll be talking uh uh we'll be talking about him have we talked have we we haven't covered him yet have we no we have not i think he's coming i think i've covered him but i don't think we we he's been part of this six yet here but uh a versatile guy overall i i just you know the the numbers definitely don't play in his favor but if they do keep nine offensive linemen, that ninth spot, I mean, I think LeGlue would have the inside track on it right now. But if someone beats him out, I could see a Chris Owens maybe being that guy. Okay. We'll see. All right, Dave, anything else you want to talk about uh, in today's show? I think we have we covered most of everything that we had down here. Uh, Mike Tomlin, I think right now about 30 to 1 odds for coach of the year. Uh, what, 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 what would it take for Mike Tomlin to finally win that award? When it winning the division, do it. Is that award ever considered postseason play? When is that award I don't think it, decided? I, I, don't, I don't think it does, does it? I, I don't pay much attention to it. Um, so let's assume it's just regular season. It would probably require this team to, yes, win the division um, and probably go like, you know, win at least 12 games. At least that many? Is it, is the reason why we 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 don't see this with a Steelers coach is because the expectations are so high every year. And, I think and, to a degree. Uh, and it's, Oh, that's the Steelers are expected to be in the playoffs every year. And then thus uh, the shock value is not there. And, 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 and the surprise and, and the feel good story and, and everything that goes along with that. Uh, uh, you know, you see where I'm going there. Is that, I is do. that, you know, in other well, words, obviously the Steelers don't don't you know uh, are one game over five hundred uh, in you know second or third in division. Mike Tomlin's not going to get any votes for, for for coach of the year. Sure, whenever the Mike Tomlin's never had a losing season stat gets mentioned every eight seconds, I mean, then they win ten games. People just kind of shrug their shoulders shoulders and say, "Yeah, well, kind of expected that to happen." But I think maybe the things have changed a bit this year because it is a new quarterback situation. There is no Ben, and it isn't Tomlin and Ben working together, and so it may be viewed in a, diff- in a different light if it's Mitch Trubisky or Kenny Pickett or some combination thereof, you know, leading this team to a division title. But I think it would have to take. Because the dude's never won it before, right? right? And he's had some really good years. So it's going to take something over the top to really compel voters to look his way. I think about definitely if they don't win the North, then he's not going to win it or even have a chance. Um, but it would require, I think, winning the North and winning it convincingly. Okay. All right. 
Uh, let's see. You're right for some emails here. Paul Brown writes in locker room leadership. Uh, David Knox, I think we can all agree that Cam Hayward is the leader of this team. And even Tomlin stated in his interview with Ryan Clark that Najee Harris is being groomed to be the next leader. He says, I just listened to Pat McAfee's interview with Kenny Pickett. And he said, Cam Sutton has really stepped up uh, to show him the ropes. Uh, he says, would you say a player needs to be one of the best on the field to be a, uh, to be a leader or can they like, can they be like Cam Sutton, a solid player, but an even better leader? What are your thoughts on, on this, on Sutton is one of the locker room leaders. Well, look, Paul, in your, your very email there, I think you mentioned Ryan Clark, you know, uh, wasn't, wasn't Ryan Clark a, a, a team leader, but, but, but not one of the quote unquote stars of, uh, on, on the team. Yeah, that sounds right. I mean, that defense was so good. I mean, it felt like he didn't even need to have a de facto leader because we're just a veteran, solid cast of characters. Um, you know, for a I while, think, what, wasn't Brett Kiesel kind of that guy on defense? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think there's different things. There's leadership within your room, within, let's say, your cornerback room versus within a side of the ball versus an overall team kind of feel. So I think they all kind of take different shapes and different forms and – I think Sutton's going to be one of the definitely one of the leaders in that cornerback room and certainly can help mentor and show any young guy the ropes about how the NFL works. So, yeah, I mean, I don't think you have to be, you know, one of the best guys on the team. But I think generally speaking, to kind of be viewed as that overall team leader, you typically have to be one of the best guys, a Cam Hayward, a TJ Watt, a Ben Roethlisberger, something like that to kind of be the overall face of the team. Uh, Courtney Adam Schefter, Terry McLaurin officially signed his three year contract extension today. So we're going to be waiting even longer for the, uh, 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 for these numbers to come out. It looks like. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So I guess he waited until after the holiday to uh, get into town. Right. I mean, we've been, uh, the, the news on this broke. What um, wasn't it last month? Was it when, when did the original news break on McLaren's deal? Uh, about yeah, five, six days ago, I think. Right. And anyway, we're going to be waiting longer for the finer details of that one. I was hoping it'd surface early this week, but it's probably not going to, uh, to happen there. Uh, let's see, let's go back to the email machine here and let's see, David, Matthew, a lot of people send me well wishes on my health and all like that. I appreciate that. Got a little bit ways to go here, but I'm doing much better. Uh, first off, thank you for uh, all inspire in, inspiring us uh, to pursue deeper knowledge of the Steelers roster. But here's my question with the signing of Larry Joby: What does this mean for everyone else playing? I know a lot of people usually, uh, I, I know a lot of people usually mean Mon Montrevious Adams, but I'm thinking mainly Tyson Alualu. Alualu's 37, so he's going to be uh, losing steam soon enough. So what, 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 what does Larry Ogunjobi, uh mean for everyone else playing? Well, it certainly makes a, Crowded room, even more crowded. I don't think it's Alu Alu's on the chopping block. If he is, it's just because, you know, he just can't play anymore, regardless of Ogan Joby's presence or not. He's only 36, by the way, so I don't think he's 37 yet either. Um, and I don't see Ogan Joby as that true nose tackle role that Alu Alu's occupying right now. So we'll see. I mean, they certainly, it, it's certainly possible. So nothing that says they can't keep seven. Um, and as Dave likes to say, these things have a funny way of working right. themselves out, whether that's an injury or who knows what else happens. But we had this conversation a week or two ago, and I think if you if you made me choose one guy to cut right now, I would say Isaiah Loudermilk. Wow, would be Loudermilk? Hmm. Huh. Yeah, I mean, just in terms of you know, can this guy offer anything as a pass rusher? He's really limited there. And if you add Ogan Joby, I don't know. I mean. It, it's hard to come up with a name. There is no easy answer there, but if maybe choose a name, I think a lot of Moke's kind of the, uh, the number seven right that'd be, now. That'd be very disappointing based on, I mean, I, I'm not saying it's not uh, impossible, but man, <laughs> you look back at what the, you know, training up to get a guy that was basically a, 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 you know, it felt like just cause he was a body fit at the time, you know, mm -hmm. a, a yeah. measurable fit, uh, be very disappointing for him to wash out, uh, so quick. Yeah, I guess it would be, but I mean, he could land on the practice squad and who knows what happens from there. Marcus Allen was a guy that was a mid-round pick, made the team the one year, practice squad the next year, came back. So it wouldn't necessarily end his career, but they may have a tough, I mean, if they cut anybody, it's going to be a tough decision if they do mm -hmm. only keep six. So 
you gotta you gotta cut somebody that you like. All right, let's uh, go back to the let's see. Brett Martin Niles got a book here for us. Uh, you've been asked several times about the difference between Colbert and Khan, and I have a couple of thoughts I want to ask. Since Khan did the contracts, I personally don't think we have learned anything about the differences yet. Yes, they signed Fitzpatrick early, and they signed a one-year vet, uh, but the cap situation was a lot better this year, and they did give Turner essentially a one-year deal last year. I think the one-year deals had more to do with unexpected retirements of DeCastro and Tuit and the cap space that created than any change in philosophy. Okay, but the thing with uh, with Turner now, remember that that there's kind of this threshold about three and a half to four million that, yeah, they have signed players to one year deals in the past. But I've always kind of stipulated that, you know, you get over that that four million mark. That's generally when they try to do the two year two year deals uh, uh, with them. And, yeah, they were uh, or, or and have been in a better uh, situation. But uh uh, he says he doesn't think that we've learned anything y- yet about differences between Colbert and Khan. How would you how would you respond to that? Well, I mean, it's very, very early, so I wasn't expecting to learn a whole lot about Omar Khan in the middle of June, you know, but I think you've seen a couple things. And it's really are these just one offs? Are they trends where they become patterns and ultimately philosophy and style? So I think you're kind of waiting some for some more information, but I think you can extrapolate something from the Fitzpatrick deal getting done in the middle of June and the Oak and Joby contract structure is still a bit different than, than the way Pittsburgh typically does it. So I think you can look to those things a little bit. And, and it's fair to say that Khan may be changing, tweaking, I should say, kind of the philosophy of the way Pittsburgh does business. And never have we said, you know, these are hard, fast. Oh, well, this is the way it's going to be. But you know, we are trying to note differences in the process here. and. We haven't even got into the season yet. We don't know if he's going to keep three quarterbacks. You would think he's going to keep, uh, you know, three quarterbacks. But we have a lot to learn about differences uh, uh, between these guys, right? Sure. I mean, there's a long ways to go, and we'll be able to find all those things out as we go through the process. But anytime something a little different, because Pittsburgh's been just so predictable for so long, anytime there's even a minor change to your expectations, I think it's worth talking about. I think it's pretty foolish on Brett's part to not think that, you know, Fitzpatrick signing a one year deal this early. I mean, signing uh, his big deal this early in the offseason is not a significant change. Yeah, I would agree. Now, to play devil's advocate, though, Marquise Pouncey did get a deal in the middle of summer, I think the one time. Correct. Right. But I think we had noted that, you know, how much did Ben Roethlisberger have to play with that? Well, we don't know the answer for that, I suppose. Right. So, right. I mean, Colbert, it's and not like he never did it. also wasn't an earth shattering contract. You know, it wasn't, you know. It was a pretty big deal, wasn't it? For, for, for a center, I guess, at the time. But, I mean, guaranteed money and all like that, it, it was it was a standard at the time. How, what was the contract total? It was it was five years, 44 million, which I know is not Fitzpatrick level money. It was also in 2014 and, and money in general wasn't what it was today. But I mean that's that's a that's a mega deal. I would still call that. Okay. Uh, let's the high see. Center. Is other question here where I think we may see a difference is on roster cut down day. That is where we may see changes. He says, "Will Khan still keep three quarterbacks, or will he go with two like a lot of the rest of the league?" Uh, I'll be shocked if Khan keeps two quarterbacks. Uh, Brad, really? Huh? I could see if they were to trade Mason. I could. I would be more surprised if they kept three than kept okay. two. We'll see. I'll be I'll be surprised if they keep uh, two. He okay. says, will they keep a big pass blocking uh, running back or will they go with the best pure runners? He says is six defensive linemen set in stone or is a is is the five wide receiver flexible? Uh, how will he fill out last few roster spots? Will it be special teams ability or will it be position depth? I'll be surprised if it's not special teams ability. Uh, right now, we we don't have an. Uh, ha- he says, right now we really don't have an idea how that will go. Thoughts? Well, I think the thought is we <laughs> don't know how it's <laughs> gonna go. <laughs> Brett, Brett, I think tries to outthink him. I think Brett, what Brett's issue is, I think Brett's one of the guys I met that came to Vegas one time. Uh, I think Brett tries to be 
kind of crafty in his emails and the fact that he tries to play gotcha. But I think what Brett ends up trying to do is outthink himself sometimes here. Uh, uh, look, we, we've said we're going to have to monitor what's going to happen with Omar Khan moving forward. And our job is to kind of highlight any changes or anything out of the ordinary that, that we see happen. Uh, I don't, I think the six, the, the, the five wide receivers versus the six defensive linemen. I'm, I'm more interested to see if they go to a seventh defensive lineman on the 53 more so than I'm interested about maybe a potential sixth wide receiver. In other words, I think a sixth wide receiver is more plausible than a seventh defensive lineman. Does that make sense? No, it does. And I agree. Um, yeah, I, I think Brett, these are all important questions. We just don't know the answers to. We just have to be patient and wait it out. And in time, obviously, we're going to get those answers in terms of what Khan does differently and how the roster is going to look. And I can't answer any of those questions right now. There are so many variables to it, but it'll be interesting. And also remember, I know Khan is the GM, but Andy Wilde is going to have a big, big role in, in the construction of this roster as well as the kind of quote unquote football guy. So what does Andy Wilde want, his philosophies, his ideals? That's going to be, to me, almost just, just as important. You know, some of these finer details and, and look, I understand why they're asked and, 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 and why people want to talk about them. But as I have, un- uh, and we have all unfortunately learned over the years, sadly, some of these wet things have a funny way of working themselves out. And unfortunately, injury plays a big part in that, you know, uh, you know, sitting here splitting hairs about seventh defensive lineman. Uh, by the time you get to September 11th, might it be a lot easier to decipher because of something that's happened on the roster health wise? You know what I'm saying mm-hmm. uh, there? Uh, but I mean, look, you, you talk about the two quarterbacks that I mean, that's really notable. You talk about a potential seventh defensive lineman just based on history. That's notable. Would it hurt my feelings if they kept seven? Uh, uh, I mean, obviously, it depends on, well, where where does that position come from you know uh is it is it the third quarterback uh is it uh an extra running back you know where exactly is that coming from uh, overall that you know uh i guess would be my thoughts on that uh i think they have to find a way to get cameron hayward to not have to play as many snaps plain and simple yeah i mean that would be ideal whatever, whatever that, would- that means that was their goal last year, and that went out the window once there was no Tuit and no Tyson and even no Carlos Davis. And so it became Cam Hayward, play as much as you possibly can, and even play no stackle because we got no other options. So, I mean, there's going to be hopefully an effort to reduce some of those snap totals that he, he's been dealing with for the bulk of his career. And and what, what does that mean? What does that look like? I mean, even if you got Cameron Hayward off the field, five snaps on average more per game, five times 17 is what? And that's what night is that? Uh, 75. I'm not sure what the number is. Seven. Let's, let's do math to close out the show. 85. Okay. So that, you know, it doesn't sound like a lot, but you know, to me, it, it's worth it. Every time you can get them off the field. If, if at all possible. And I would love just one blowout victory where you can just kind of bench your starters, your defensive linemen for the is fourth that allowed? quarter. Now, yeah, in Pittsburgh, I don't think it is. But, man, it'd be nice just to have one where you win it comfortably and Hayward gets out by the end of the third quarter. And that that's really a good way to get you guys to stay fresh. Yeah, and even put uh, 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 a backup, you know, a rookie quarterback in to take some snaps and hand the ball off to a backup running back uh, for a, a series and a half or more in a fourth quarter would, would certainly be nice. Yep. But looking at the start of Pittsburgh schedule, especially, I don't know where that blowout victory <laughs> game may come from. It'd be nice if we're talking about one, that's for sure. Yep. All right, let's, let's see if we can maybe get one more uh, question here. Uh, 
Uh, NorCal writes in, happy Independence Day weekend. I think a problem with incentive-based contracts could be that if you have incentives for tackles or sacks, for example, you could chase after that rather than playing your position or area that's opening up a play for the uh, uh, for the offense that goes right 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 through yeah look uh this guy i think this goes back to i'd really like to to hook kevin colbert up to the lie detector should we ever get him up uh, uh on the on the podcast or ever you know what are some of the main reasons why you've never seen playtime incentives or performance based incentive type type stuff uh contracts with players and, and i i think the reasoning here is a sound one. Do you really want to get, you know, uh, a, a player dependent on tackles or sacks versus, you know, something else, you know, playtime incentives. If it's going to be any time type of incentives, I think I would want it to be playtime incentives so that you don't have an instance where you have a player just chasing sacks or something. Yeah, I think incentives overall just make things messier for the team, for the player, and that's for the cap perspective of it all. And that just is probably the big reason why Kevin Colbert avoided it. And I think you have another another thing where, you know, you, you do it for one, others wonder why you don't do it for them. Mm-hmm. You know? Right. And I, I think the students have always tried to build their build their their roster that way with a fairness aspect of it, especially when it comes to the financial end of things. Pittsburgh has the tooth toothpaste model of keep it in the tube. Once you let a little out, you can't put that toothpaste right. back in the tube. And that's happening with the guaranteed contracts. If they held on to that for as long as they could, and you know, that that's standard has gone away probably and probably the same with why they don't want to let one guy have the exception for incentives. All right. I think we made it about an hour and a half here, right? I think so. So we'll come back on Friday and talk about probably more movie reviews because that oh, might Lord. be all there is to talk about. All right. Uh, something, we'll see if something breaks before then. We'll, we'll figure out something. We'll obviously continue our, uh, our 90 and 30, uh, uh, six more players to break down that way and uh, whatever else pops up in the meantime on Friday. So uh, in the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter at Steeders Depot. Follow Alex on Twitter at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, theterriblepodcast at gmail.com. Uh, let's see. Uh, go to the site, uh, SteedersDepot.com. Hit the donate button, upright navigational bar, uh, or hit the uh, ad free button as well, too, for $25 for, for one year. You can have access and add free access to the uh, to the site that way. So until Friday, somebody let me know about the ending of that, uh, <laughs> that movie <laughs> as well, too. As always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.